Good morning, everyone. I'm Mr. Hino Fusawa, Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 IMF World Bank Spring Meetings and this important seminar on debt vulnerabilities and developing needs in low-income countries. As you know, one of the top priorities of the IMF is for low-income countries to achieve higher and more inclusive growth and to reach their own development objectives. We are deeply engaged with our low-income members through capacity building and financial support where needed. Over the past two decades, low-income countries have made an important progress on several dimensions. Real per capita income has risen by 50% on average. Poverty rates have fallen from 60% to 40%. School enrollment rates have increased to 60%, and infant mortality was halved. Despite these achievements, low-income countries face major challenges in accelerating growth in per capita income levels and generating good jobs for fast-growing labor forces. Higher levels of uh, public spending on health, education, and infrastructure are needed to support strong growth and achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. But these spending needs have to be seen against the backdrop of uh, rapidly rising uh, debt burdens across the many low-income countries. The median level of uh, public debt now stands at 47% of GDP. And two out of every five of these countries are currently assessed uh, to be at high risk of debt distress or already in debt distress. The drivers of uh, the debt increase vary across countries. For some, it was driven by scaling up uh, public uh, investment. Uh, for some others, the by commodity price shocks or natural disasters. And still for others, uh, by too loose uh, fiscal policies. So how can low-income countries uh, rise to a challenge of uh, containing debt vulnerabilities uh, while increasing spending uh, to meet their development needs? The answer is all stakeholders, national authorities, bilateral and marital partners, and private creditors that have a role to play. The first, national authorities. A successful journey to achieve development objectives and must start with good domestic policies. This means a stronger revenue mobilization to create a space for development needs. Our recent regional economic outlook publication highlights that tax revenues could be increased by three to the five percentage point of GDP in sub-Saharan African countries. At the same time, Investment plans that should focus on projects with high rates of return that are subjected to careful examination and prioritization. Debt monitoring and reporting capacities that should also be improved to allow accurate tracking of the evolution of debt and to assist with planning and overall debt management. Second, development partners can also help Official development assistance uh, for, uh, from uh, the OECD debt countries is currently about 0.3% of their GDP. Doubling ODA to deliver on uh, the existing target of 0.7% of GDP would provide significant additional resources uh, to finance the SDGs. Third, why the main responsibility is on uh, the borrowers uh, lenders can also play a role uh, in maintaining uh, debt sustainability in low-income countries. When extending new loans, official and private lenders should assess the impact on borrowers' debt positions to help identify appropriate terms and conditions. This would protect both lenders and borrowers from finding themselves in the situation that that could cause the painful financial difficulties in the future. 
critical for such effort is debt transparency by both borrowers and lenders. So the bottom line is every stakeholders must do their part for low-income countries to achieve the development objectives while containing debt vulnerabilities. How can the IMF help uh, with this? Uh, let me highlight a few initiatives. Uh, in terms of analytics, together with the World Bank, uh, we have revised the debt sustainability framework for low-income countries that are in July last year. The objective is to uh, facilitate understanding and monitoring of debt vulnerabilities and to serve as a tool uh, to support sustainable borrowing and lending practices. Based on this framework, we we'll provide various policy advice to country authorities. The fund also uh, supports the country's efforts through our capacity development activities. Various uh, technical assistance and training programs help countries strengthen their public financial and public investment management practices. For instance, we have conducted a public investment management assessment, PMARS, uh, in over 30 countries. The fund also assists uh, our members' efforts uh, to enhance uh, their revenue mobilization capacity. In addition, our technical assistance also targets and helping our members on the various uh, debt issues, uh, such as uh, debt reporting, uh, debt instruments and markets, and debt management strategies. As one of the stakeholders, uh, we are doing our part. Well, these are just a few thoughts on what I hope uh, the discussion will address. Uh, I look forward to a stimulating and informative exchange of views. With these remarks, I will give the floor to uh, Ms. Kachingula uh, to begin the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Furusawa. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and thank you for making it for our discussion today on debt vulnerabilities and development needs in low-income countries. As uh, Mr. Furusawa has put it, he's, he's given us a very well-rounded view of some of the issues we're going to be discussing today. And just to remind you that uh, you can Im get involved in the conversation online. Lots of people can't be here in this room, but would love to hear what's going on so use the hashtag development for all or IMF meetings and we'll be happy to see your tweets or comments I'll also let you know now that uh, there are headsets as one of our panelists is a French speaker so you might want to look for that on your seat as it will be useful so all of this week we've been hearing that we're in a delicate moment when it comes to the global economy and in many ways that's something you could say about the state of debt for low-income countries. It is a delicate moment. If you cast your mind back to 2005 and the Glen Eagles Summit, that was a pivotal moment of doubling aid and cancelling debt. And yet today, as Mr. Furusawa has put it, we find ourselves in a difficult situation, a situation where some of the world's poorest countries have seen their debt repayments double since 2010. But we're also seeing remarkable growth and remarkable stories of people being pulled out of poverty. So how can debt develop, how can managing debt and development financing needs be put together in harmony to produce the kind of picture that we'd want to see in the world today? This is something that we're about to discuss and I'm very pleased to say that uh, we have a very able panel. I will introduce them in order of seating. Uh, on my left, Mr. Mahamat Abakar Alali, the Honorable Minister of Finance and Budget from Chad. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, also with us, uh, Finance Secretary of Bangladesh, Mr. Abdul Roof Talukder. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we also have the Minister of Finance for Zambia with us today, Ms. Margaret Mwanakatwe. Thank you so much for coming. And Mr. Daniel Hanna, who is Global Head of Public Sector and Development Organizations at Standard Chartered Bank. Great to have you with us. And Mr. Jakob von Weizsäcker, Chief Economist, Ministry of Finance, Germany. Thank you very much all for being here. So we will jump right in. If I start with you, uh, Minister Mwanakatwe. We've been hearing this week that 17 African countries are now at high risk of debt distress. Talk to us a little bit about 
your experience when it comes to borrowing countries in a position like yours? What are the factors that need to be considered? Thank you, Nancy. I'm certainly one of those 17. <laughs> Thank and, you for your uh, candor. Happy to be here today and thanks for the invitation to talk about debt, vulnerabilities and the development needs of low-income countries. I'm happy to say that I'm not a low-income country. I'm actually a middle-income country, but still in high risk of debt distress. And this discussion could not have been more timely. And I believe that with this type of engagement, we can, in sharing thoughts, we can map a way forward that can bring about the sustainability that we need to ensure that the debt that we contract is actually good debt. Because I believe my 10 billion external debt, uh, 10 billion US dollars, is actually good debt. But when you hear uh, of uh, uh, figures such as the IMF's uh, debt sustainability analysis for developing countries, that 40% of low income developing countries now face significant debt related challenges. And this is up from 21%. By mid 2018, the number of low income developing countries in high risk of debt distress or already in debt distress is reported to have risen from 13 to 31, with 24 of those being high risk. And as I said, I'm one of them. And seven in debt distress. That backdrop is sad. And this is where we need to move from that sadness to some level of optimism. And that's why, for me, the trend is concerning. But what is encouraging me is that here we are in high risk of debt distress. Here we are, so many countries low income. Um, the threat could be contagious. And we dare not let that happen. We've all, many of us have accessed global money from capital markets. And the impact of a global, on the global economy, if we don't stem this, could be huge. So I'm looking at a situation where we, in this sort of situation, should be managing a debt crisis. We dare not get into a debt crisis. So that, if, I, the if I may just ask, uh, because you've talked about good debt, for Zambia, what is good debt? Good debt is uh, threefold. I have a vast country, 752,000 square kilometers. Most of the development has been along the line of rail. Most of the rural areas where there's lots of opportunity have had no road. So we've built a road to that rural area. We've put power. We've brought solar, or we've taken transmission line under hydro. We've brought a school, whereas somebody used to move 50 kilometers to walk for a school, we've brought the school 10 kilometers. The same with hospitals, the same with clinics. We brought it nearer so that we can begin to attract the much needed private sector investment into those areas. That's what I call good debt. Okay. Now with that, of course, must come with a return on that good debt so that we see that revenue impacting your debt sustainability. Let me bring in Mr. Uh, Taluk Dare here because Bangladesh is often looked at as the good pupil in the classroom. Um, you've, you've, got some, uh, you've got some impressive, impressive numbers. Your debt to GDP ratio is one of the lowest in the world and yet you're managing to achieve uh, uh, high growth rates as well. What's the secret? <coughs> well, first of all, uh, thank you. Uh, the first secret is, you know, what we borrow, we invest all the money. That's our secret. Invest all your money. All our money we invested, actually to, to ensure the intergenerational equity. So this is the first one we do. And two areas basically we, we choose. One is um, the, we, we invest for the physical infrastructure development as well as human capital development. This is another area. And for over the last 25 years, we maintain the uh, macroeconomic stability very prudently and public borrowings uh, we, we, we calculated that did not crowd out private investment in our country so this is another area and the cost of borrowings that we borrow from abroad and domestically um, 
is always below the nominal GDP growth rate. That actually helps us to maintain fiscal sustainability. I just want to give you two more points, you know. Uh, one is Bangladesh, as you mentioned, we repaying all our loans with an installment on time, regularly and religiously. That's very important. And as she said, the Madam said, we have already graduated from LIC to middle income country, fulfilling all three P conditions. So if there was a, if, if you could look, look, look around at other countries that are struggling with debt now, at, at risk of debt distress, what is the advice that you would give? Well, I cannot advise, but I can say what we are doing. <laughs> uh, we redo... Where do you think other countries are going wrong? Well, uh, th that's what I'm saying, what we are doing. <laughs> we, <laughs> uh, we limit our fiscal deficit always below 5% of GDP. So, uh, and we have our fiscal law, and in that law, we, we, we explicitly mention that debt to, uh, debt to GDP ratio to be reduced over the years. So we follow these uh, preconditions, and as I mentioned that uh, we limit our fiscal deficit below 5% all the time. We never exceeded that limit. So this is the you know, uh, very basic principle we are following over the years. Okay. Uh, let's bring in Mr. Uh, Weissacker, because when we, when we talk about the debt landscape, uh, and we look back at 2005 and uh, the Glen Eagle Summit, we see that uh, there was also commitment to, to doubling aid. But now we're seeing a situation where aid is, is flatlining, official development assistance is flatlining. What do you think is, is the future of uh, official development assistance? Well, I, th I, th I think it clearly has a future and the commitment is still, still strong. And while, of course, there's no, no rapid increases and the commitment uh, to, uh, which, which is not universally shared, unfortunately, but it's quite widely shared, uh, to, to reach 0.7% um, on, on, on uh, ODA. Um, I think you're seeing progress in, in a certain number of countries, including my own, if you sort of take a longer-term perspective. Um, Germany is now, the, they're sort of in, in, in absolute terms, the second uh, largest donor, donor worldwide. Um, of course, you know, in, in every yearly budget, we're struggling uh, uh, to maintain this. But um, so... so um, I, th I think there has been progress, even though um, if you, if you ta take an overall view, it's been mixed. And I think, I guess, the overall em envelope um, is, is almost stagnant. It's still increasing a little bit. So, so let's, let's, be, uh, let's, uh, um, le let's be honest about it. I, I don't think that by itself, of course, um, um, uh, um, ODA is going to fix the problem. We have one very favorable factor, which wasn't mentioned uh, compared to... 10 years ago or, or 15 years ago, which is that uh, it looks like long-term interest rates globally um, have come down. And that helps. Um, and if um, markets expect um, debt to be sustainable, uh, that, of course, translates in, in, in sustainably low interest rate. I mean, that's a, that's a good thing. A critical is, of course, always growth rates. Uh, and, uh, and if growth rates are high and interest rates are low, you don't have a problem. If growth, growth rates are low and interest rates are high, you have a massive problem. And I fear that I even if, and uh, I, I'm not denying we need to do our homework, but even if we do our homework on, on ODA, um, um, we're not going to fix that sort of problem in, in the long run. So I think this is about ODA, this is about do domestic resource mobilization, this is about creating growth. This is about uh, um, quality of public finances in, 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 the, in the member states in question. And, uh, and this is about private finance. I mean, one of the things um, Germany did during its G20 presidency was to launch the Compact with Africa initiative, saying, uh, look, why, why is it that so many countries in Asia managed to have private sector-led growth success models? And why is it so hard? to do this in Africa, and we are absolutely convinced, I guess everybody on the panel is convinced, this is perfectly possible to do in Africa as well. But, but of course, uh, um, it's, it's easy to say in the abstract, but it's much more difficult to put into practice, and, and that's also, I think, everybody appreciates. But if there was a number of examples um, uh, that one could follow, that do would you, really Do you help. see any examples at all? that could be followed? Well, I mean, there, um, uh, uh, as you may know, there are now 12 um, countries uh, in, in the compact with Africa. 
um, and they're making pro progress. I mean, they're making progress in the sense that private sector uh, investment has really come up, and they're making progress in the sense that many private businesses, given the reforms that have already been made, are now uh, contem contemplating to engage. Um, and I, I think, I mean, it's, it's not something um, uh, um, that will happen overnight, but I think if we stay at it in a five to 10 year time horizon, um, th I think this is a very, very promising uh, 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 strategy. So we must not neglect the role that private uh, sector investments can play as well. Oh. Well, if we can come to you, um, Minister uh, Alali, talking about other, other forms of financing, how important is it for Chad, for instance, to, to look at revenue, to, to look at raising revenue as one of those ways of managing debt levels? Uh, merci, Madame, de nous donner l'opportunité de parler de notre pays dans un cadre uh, comme celui-là. Euh, surtout pour essayer de partager notre expérience. Il me plaît de rappeler, peut-être ici, de rappeler que le Tchad, après une FRPC et un premier programme avec le fonds, euh, financé par une facilité euh, élargie de crédit 2014-2017, s'est engagé dans un euh, troisième programme. Euh, dans le cadre de ce programme, naturellement, la principale euh, bataille à gagner, c'est celle de la mobilisation de ressources domestiques. C'est vrai que euh, les aides extérieures nous aident à combler notre finance publique, mais je crois que l'effort principal doit venir d'abord euh, de nous, euh, de nos ressources propres. Comme quelqu'un a eu à le dire, ces ressources propres, la mobilisation des ressources domestiques nous permettra de nous dégager une marge de manœuvre dans le sens du financement des investissements qui sont indispensables. Indispensables en ce sens que tout programme de stabilisation a tendance à comprimer la consommation. Quand on comprime la consommation, on a tendance à tirer l'économie vers le bas. Or, il faut impérativement un programme d'investissement susceptible de relancer l'économie. Donc, nous... On n'a pas encore gagné la bataille de la mobilisation optimale des recettes, mais on a mis en place quand même euh, en route un certain nombre de mesures euh, visant à optimiser, à vraiment euh, arriver à rassembler tout ce qui est susceptible d'être euh, reversé à l'état. C'est ainsi qu'on a essayé de devenir une euh, stratégie fiscale qui consiste à faire la part de choses entre... Euh, euh, la mobilisation des ressources pour le compte de l'État, mais aussi tout en veillant à faire une place pour les investisseurs. Les investisseurs tant les, euh, les investisseurs au titre de l'IDE que des initiatives locales qui sont susceptibles d'investir. Donc de ce côté-là, beaucoup d'efforts euh, ont été faits et euh, nous nous battons pour optimiser. Mais l'optimisation, la récolte de ressources euh, nationales passe aussi par l'élargissement de la base fiscale. Le, en Afrique, les choses ne sont pas aussi euh, aisées qu'en Occident parce que euh, euh, l'évasion fiscale est relativement importante. Il faut déceler euh, non seulement la, cette fuite, euh, cette évitation de la fiscalité, mais aussi chercher des matières imposables pour que cette base-là puisse être élargie et comme ça générer des ressources euh, pour le compte de l'État. Il y a également... Euh, euh, l'accroissement du rendement fiscal. Can you, can you just expound on that a little bit? Because you're saying you, you haven't yet won the battle uh, to raise more revenue um, domestically at home. What are the specific challenges you've come against, as you've mentioned, tax evasion, and what strategies are you using to combat them? Mais, euh, la stratégie que nous essayons de... Il faut déjà vous dire qu'au Tchad, on est entre 8 et 9 percent de PIB de fiscalisation, alors que d'autres pays similaires aux nôtres sont autour de 15 à 16 C'est vous dire qu'on n'a pas encore gagné la bataille. Et ces pays tendent vers les 20 Nous, qu'est-ce qu'on a mis comme stratégie D'abord, un, euh, accroître le rendement de la fiscalité. Le rendement de la fiscalité en essayant de, euh, de réduire tant que faire se peut l'intervention de l'homme. C'est-à-dire utiliser l'informatique. Les, nouvelles, euh, les nouveaux outils euh, de, de communication et de l'informatique 
pour essayer de faire en sorte que l'intervention de l'homme soit limitée. Donc c'est euh, en développant des, euh, des technologies nouvelles, en faisant usage de, de ces technologies afin euh, de rentrer dans les recettes. De l'autre côté, du, euh, il y a d'autres outils tels que le scanner pour la douane, le suivi électronique des cargaisons pour les services de douane. Donc, euh, de tels outils ont été mis en œuvre pour essayer de récolter au mieux les recettes de l'État. Okay. Et puis, euh, un dernier point qu'on a toujours tendance à oublier, c'est l'investissement dans, euh, euh, dans le fisc, dans les agents du fisc, c'est-à-dire dans leur capacité et même dans leur motivation. OK. Mm. Thank you very much. So that's a very interesting point about how techne technology can be such a, an important enabler. Uh, Mr. Hanna, if I could bring you in, because Standard Chartered has been quite, quite passionate about championing the sustainable development goals. Um, but as we're hearing here from uh, Minister Alali, there's quite a few challenges um, involved with that. Uh, as, as he said, mobilizing revenue in his country is, is, is such a big challenge, let alone all the other development needs that need to be financed. What's the role of private sector in this? Um, thank you, Nancy. And can I um, maybe first just express my thanks to the IMF for, I think, first of all, inviting me to this panel, but also uh, putting on such a distinguished panel of speakers on what I think is a very important topic. And I think what, what I think is particularly good about this panel is that we are not just talking about debt is bad, but we are actually talking about how countries can develop and achieve the same development goals. And I think their debt has to play some kind of role, I think, as the Honourable Minister has mentioned, in terms of where debt can play an enabling role to support growth, to support investment in social and physical infrastructure. It can then catalyse further growth to achieve a rise in living standards. And, I mean, let's sort of really just set the scene in terms of some numbers here, which I think are worth talking about. I mean, to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, it's estimated there's about $2.5 trillion gap a year in financing that is required. And as we heard somewhat politely put, ODA financing is effectively flatlining at this point. So there is a big challenge here that needs to be filled somehow. And for the low-income countries, that probably works out to around $350 billion a year of investment that is required to achieve those SDGs. Now, domestic resource mobilization, as the minister has mentioned, I think is absolutely critically important. And that probably gets you about half of the way. But that still leaves this gap. So how can we do it? Well, I think as as, the, um, as Jacob just mentioned, the private sector then has to play a role to kind of effectively fill that gap and catalyze broader uh, investment trends. And I think the good news, at least, is, is that the private sector, I think, is very interested and willing to do so. Um, if you look at the amount of money, 350 billion for low-income countries, it's about 10 to 20 percent of GDP. That sounds like quite a lot. But put in terms of the global balance sheet, in terms of the amount of assets under management that's out there, in terms of 85 trillion, then that number seems a little bit more achievable. And I think we've seen a real rise in interest from the private sector in terms of financing the SDGs and in terms of financing development goals. So I don't actually think it's just about the money, that the actual quantum is not the issue. It's about how we can channel that money to where it matters the most. How can we actually catalyze the funding to go into low-income mm -hmm. countries? And I think there, that is the, that's the critical issue. Now, Standard Chartered as an international bank that's present in some of these markets um, can play a role, as can other international banks. But I think there's also a, a piece around how we can work together to achieve that. And I think, if I may, I just sort of, I'd split out sort of three broader themes about not just money, but I think one of them very much is um, about the broader private sector commitment. And I think, again, one of the encouraging things is you've seen international companies realize that they have a very important role to mitigate the risks from their own operations, so to make sure that we're not harming the communities and the environment that we're operating in. So, for example, Stanchart last year announced that we were going to calculate the aggregate emissions from all our financing activity and then try and manage that down over a period of time, given the challenge of climate change. Um, and I think there's also the importance, I think as Jacob mentioned, of the sort of uh, creating SMEs and low-income, uh, sorry, small companies who can create the jobs and growth that I think a lot of the countries are needed. I think the second thing that I would sort of pull out is this issue around partnerships and, and effectively sharing the risk. Because I think there are certain things that the public sector, frankly, is better at doing. I, I, and I think you could arguably say that health systems and education, these are really important um, public goods which the public sector is best to play. But there are other areas, such as infrastructure, where you can risk share across both <coughs> private sector and public sector. 
And I think the use of PPPs, for example, which many countries are now adopting, is a very good way of, um, of doing that. And then the final theme, I think, is about how do we really maximize the impact from ODA? Um, and here, blended finance, I think, has to play a really important role, using ODA to catalyze the private sector to come in, uh, using official aid to take the risks that the private sector can't manage and doesn't want to manage, but then sort of effectively encouraging the private sector to come in and play a bigger role, increasing the envelope of money that um, can potentially be invested in these countries. So b seeing as uh, we've talked here about uh, homegrown solutions as well, as we see uh, financial markets in emerging markets deepen, do you think there's going to be a rise in, in domestic borrowing as well? I, I mean, I think that there's two, two things I would pull out from that, and I, I would agree with you. I think, first of all, broadly, the access to international capital markets by a, a number of uh, low-income countries and middle-to-low-income countries I think is a positive thing, at being able to raise long-term financing, um, as Zambia and others have done, um, effectively broadens the pool of capital to come in. And the, the government is probably one of the best entities within a country, particularly small countries, that can actually capture that funding and then channel it in when it's done efficiently. But your second point, I think, is really important. The uh, importance of developing local capital markets and unlocking domestic resources as a result of that, I think we've seen that that deepening of those markets really does lead to greater financial sophistication, greater intermediation within the economy, and then more efficient sort of capital allocation and growth. Oh, thank you. Uh, Minister Monakatwe, let's talk about the issue of transparency, because um, as, as, as we have more players entering the market and more sources available uh, um, for debt, for borrowing for low-income countries, it's not always very clear what's being borrowed and at what terms. How big, is in, how big of an issue is transparency, debt transparency for you? Uh, for me, as, as Zambia, not very big. I think our debt is, is well known, and we share that with the public every single month as to where we've come from and where we're heading. And it's absolutely important to share uh, that uh, debt position or your numbers for that. How has the economy fared uh, at any given time? And we, we do that monthly and we do that quarterly for investors so that we're on the same page and they're not second guessing. We didn't do that very well in the past. And we found that that vacuum that we had left, uh, somebody else took that space and began to put innuendos and falsehoods around our debt. That's when we decided that we're going to go public with our numbers on a monthly basis and quarterly with investors. It's absolutely critical to be able to share that information uh, with uh, not just the domestic economy, but also the international com um, uh, community. Just to tell us a bit more about why it's so important and what you've learned from have, having done differently in the past and doing it this way now. Well, if I look at the number of questions or the type of questions that are coming from investors, especially those that are in, have invested in, in three of my euro bonds, I've seen them becoming more and more confident because of that transparency that we have created around the numbers. And around that means that we are also sharing what potentially we're going to be taking on as debt, meaning what's in the pipeline, what potentially we may not be taken, taking on. So, the point is that uh, the investor, the private sector, wants to see you take on debt that is going to bring about development, that is going to bring about a stimulus. So I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with the minister who, say, who said that a stimulus is important, and that stimulus can come in the form of debt and the nature of the debt that you're, the debt that you're taking on. I don't believe that it is time for austerity. I think if we go austere, we're going to make life difficult for ourselves. But if we go stimulus and we take on, as I said earlier, good debt, now is the time for Africa, which I'm calling the last frontier, actually. It's India, it is Asia, it is Africa. And we have a chance to go long term. If I look at my Eurobond, for example, it was 10 years, 10 years, and 15 years. Can I go 30 years today? I probably can. Will it be cheaper? I would make sure it's cheaper. Because one of the things we don't do well is take on or refinance a debt at a higher cost. What are you doing to yourself? You're making yourself 
even more in debt, okay? We give out capital allowances, tax holidays. What are we doing? We're eroding the revenue base that the minister is talking about. We need to rethink what tax holidays we give out to these large multinationals because the domestic revenue base is absolutely critical for us to be able to widen it, mm -hmm. deepen it, and to collect what is due to us. I think for uh, uh, FDI to flow, create an enabling business environment. Make, make it easy to do business. I think we need to move away from these long tax breaks, sometimes 15 years tax break. You've lost revenue for 15 years. And if we are transparent and we are treating investors squarely um, and, uh, and fairly, they're more likely to come to you and where you have a predictable environment of doing business and you're transparent about it, you're more likely to get that investment that you require and the revenue base, the revenue base should broaden. Mr. Hanna, you wanted to jump in Sorry, there. Sorry, no, thank you. And I, I, I just wanted to agree with the Minister of Finance for Zambia here. I, I think we, um, at Standard Chartered, we work on a pro bono basis with 13 <laughs> sovereigns around investment flows and their credit ratings. Uh, three of which are low-income countries. And, and I can reiterate this point around investors really do look at the amount of information and data that's sh shared mm -hmm. and the transparency behind it. And that, that does, the more that you do, the more encouraging that does for them to put capital to work. So I do think this is a very important theme. And I think particularly as, as the composition of debt of, of countries have, has uh, become slightly more diverse with uh, both bilateral lenders, concessional funding, market funding, uh, coming in, it, it's even more important that there's that level of transparency yeah. so investors can kind of make the right judgments. Because in the absence of that, what happens is investors effectively take the worst case scenario and become particularly risk averse. Um, and so one of the things that, that we and a number of other banks are doing as part of the international international finance is working on a set of transparency lending protocols for exactly this, working with borrower countries as well as uh, lenders to see how we can effectively formalize this. Uh, Mr. Talukde, I'd be interested to hear um, what your experience has been on debt transparency and perhaps a, a strange question. Are there any downsides? No, actually, um, it's very transparent. You know, uh, we, we have to, as per law, we have to uh, de uh, demonstrate how much uh, debt we have, including the contingent liability to the parliament. So every year we have to do that. And besides, uh, every three months, the finance minister makes a statement before the parliament and has to show how much debt we have and, and including the contingent liability. Uh, but w one more area actually coming in, that is, that is about the PPP, the public-private partnership. So, uh, well, this is a, still is a very small number we have not calculated yet. Uh, that can be added, you know, with our uh, 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 potential uh, risk of the debt, but th that amount is not very big. Uh, without that, you know, it's, it's very transparent and we are regularly uh, displaying our, our submitting the report before the parliament and, and it is uh, you know, make public and, and putting the website is there. And what difference has that made for you? Mm -hmm. For the PPP? Yes. Well, it is very insignificant uh, because our debt to GDP ratio now is uh, around 30% of GDP. It's very small compared to any countries and the PPP is less than 1%. So, so we don't uh, see any potential risk <coughs> over there in the short term. Um, Mr. Weissacker, if we look at mm -hmm. um, this issue of debt transparency and put that um, opposite um, ODA and the concerns of, 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 um, of OECD countries when it comes to investing in low-income countries. What role does debt and transparency play within that conversation? Well, I, th I think it, it does play a critical role as, as, as was already highlighted by the panel. And um, one of the things, of course, in particular to watch out for, and I think investors are doing that, bilateral lenders are doing it, multilateral lenders are doing it, um, are uh, intransparent um, and possibly collateralized borrowing arrangements where um, legacy um, creditors are, uh, run a risk of being shortchanged by um, new lenders um, securing themselves as sort of de facto um, senior status compared to the others. And that's something, of course, uh, people um, in the markets react allergically to. But it's also something that makes life really, really difficult if, uh, you, you know, you, you get an extra economic shock, you end in a situation where perhaps debt needs to be restructured, 
um, where you, you know you try to do Paris and London, those kind of um, ar arrangements, and then pe perhaps not everybody sitting around the table, and you have a, have a really complicated uh, um, a situation to deal with, and 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 so both in terms of making certain that um, uh, um, you can borrow at fav favorable rates, and in terms of making certain if push came to shove, you're not in a, you don't end up in a mess. Um, that transparency and making sure you you, you you sort of treat everybody around the table fairly um, uh, that's critically important uh, and uh, to, to be perfectly fair we all know the temptation if you're close to a dangerous situation when it comes to your debt stock the temptation sort of to push the envelope a little bit further by means of entering arrangements that afterwards come back to haunt you is always there and we know it so I think, in a sense, transparency is critical for um, lenders tempted by helping out in that somewhat problematic way, and it's critical for borrowers to, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, at, at important junctures, uh, um, exercise the, the difficult but necessary self-restraint. So I think, uh, I think if we can assure that, if we can also, on, 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 on the lender side, uh, bring in uh, new important bilateral borrowers into the Paris Club. I think I think that it would go a long way towards making the situation more sustainable. Just quickly off the back of that, because we do hear a lot about uh, campaigns to um, enhance responsible borrowing. Do we need the same for responsible lending? Yes, I mean, frankly, um, um, I mean, I, I hope I've made that quite clear. For me, this is uh, uh, um, uh, you know, there are two different sides of the same coin. If we come to you, um, Minister, I'd like oui. to hear what. Yes, yes. What oui, merci beaucoup, Madame. Je voudrais quand même insister euh, sur un point euh, de, de discussion. Là, on est en train de parler dans un contexte où euh, il y a un relatif approfondissement financier et où il y a également euh, un relatif climat des affaires, de telle sorte que l'investissement privé puisse réellement prendre le relais. Or, euh, il ne faut pas qu'on perde de vue qu'il y a des pays qui euh, n'ont pas atteint peut-être ces niveaux et de telle sorte que la croissance risque d'être étouffée du fait de l'absence de l'aide publique au développement et surtout l'aide multilatérale qui doit nécessairement venir accompagner ces, euh, ces pays pour éviter que, que l'on ne retombe dans une surchauffe qui finisse par définitivement nous tirer vers le bas. Il y a des pays pour lesquels il y a des propositions d'intervention du secteur privé il y a des propositions d'intervention euh, financière telles que la standard vient de le, de le définir, mais il y a d'autres qui n'ont pas cette possibilité, pour une raison simple. Pour notre cas, par exemple, on est sous programme avec le Fonds monétaire international où on est limité dans nos recherches de financement parce qu'il faut nécessairement euh, euh, des prêts concessionnels. Or, il se trouve que euh, dans notre pays, il y a des possibilités réelles d'investissement qu'il s'agisse de l'énergie, qu'il s'agisse des transports pour le désenclavement ou que dans les secteurs fondamentaux comme l'élevage et l'agriculture où il y a véritablement un potentiel. Un potentiel pour lequel peut-être que le climat des affaires ne permet pas à ce que les privés viennent vraiment prendre le relais mais où il est peut-être indispensable de mettre en place un dispositif PPP mais ces dispositifs PPP, il faudra que l'État ait les moyens de les accompagner. Et en ce moment, il faudra réellement réfléchir, à côté des programmes qui sont signés, de mettre en place un dispositif approprié, adapté à chaque pays, pour l'accompagner dans le sens de trouver une croissance durable, inclusive, afin que les pays soient remis sur le chantier d'une croissance réelle pour leur permettre de faire face à leurs engagements euh, au niveau de la dette. Si une telle initiative n'est pas prise, alors en ce moment, on aura fait de l'ajustement on aura restauré peut-être les finances publiques, mais euh, ça finira par s'essouffler. Voilà ce que je voulais ajouter, madame. Talk to us a little bit about um, the needs, the development needs, the financing needs, because there's often this mismatch where you have short-term loans that are trying to finance very long-term projects. But that was a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that again. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted you to talk to us a little bit uh, 
uh, about that mismatch that's often there between the development needs because you sometimes have short-term loans trying to finance very long-term projects. C'est surtout les, 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 les facilités à long terme. Comme je le disais, c'est des projets structurants qu'il faut financer. Ce n'est pas tant des projets à court terme, mais c'est des projets structurants à long et moyen terme, susceptibles vraiment de, de modifier la structure de l'économie. Il est vrai que le Tchad, par exemple, mon pays, est un pays euh, producteur de pétrole, même si sa production reste toute relative. Et euh, on peut le dire, on a pris plein la figure le, le syndrome hollandais. Ce qui fait que tous les autres secteurs de l'économie ont été pratiquement euh, ravagés par le passage à travers le pétrole. Et cette économie reste à reconstruire. Et cette reconstruction ne peut pas se faire par des prêts à court terme. Il faut nécessairement passer à travers des euh, prêts à, à, à long terme. Mais nous avons également de notre côté une question de la dette intérieure à gérer. Très souvent, les gens ont tendance à penser qu'il faut gérer la dette extérieure. Mais la question de la dette intérieure également doit être euh, considérée pour réellement donner du souffle à l'économie, mais surtout donner des ressources, des moyens aux opérateurs économiques nationaux qui peuvent avoir des initiatives. Alors en ce moment, il faudra penser à mettre en place des financements spécifiques pour nous permettre de faire face à cette exigence de la marche de l'économie. Il est vrai que cette dette intérieure doit être traité de, euh, tout à fait à l'intérieur. Mais il est euh, peut-être au regard du coût des crédits aujourd'hui, il est peut-être intéressant de regarder comment est-ce que cette, la transformation de cette dette-là peut être utilement envisagée pour vraiment donner des ressources à l'économie nationale, des ressources au système bancaire qui porte une partie de ce crédit et aux opérateurs économiques de pouvoir relancer l'économie. Voilà un peu certaines de nos préoccupations. Thank you. I'm going to come to the audience uh, for any questions and comments in just a moment. If there, oh, there's a quick hand up there. Uh, we, we can get a microphone there. Please just tell us uh, your name. Tell us if it's a comment or a question. And if it's a question, please do make it a question and a, a brief one so that we can get as many as possible. Go ahead, please. I'll make it a brief question. Um, thank you so much uh, to the panel. I'm Aditi, I'm a first year master's policy student at Princeton University. Um, quick question to the panel on uh, the implications of an increase in interest rates in the US on emerging markets and low income countries. Should we be worried about um, that kind of increasing liabilities of countries that have debt accumulated in dollars and should we be worried about reversal of capital flows and uh, how should developing countries be preparing for the event? Thank you. Mr. Yes, I think you should take that. You mentioned uh, interest rates just uh, <laughs> yes. a Yes. No, no, I mean, um, in a sense, if you look at, at the US, um, uh, the Trump administration just did a very interesting, if you like, natural experiment. Um, they decided to engage in a relatively uh, pro-cyclical um, um, fiscal policy. Um, so um, uh, they're sort of at the top of the cycle and, and they did a lot of um, deficit spending through tax reform and other measures. Um, and of course the natural uh, um, response would have been uh, um, under an sort of normal circumstances for, for interest rates to go up further. Uh, but we're not really seeing that. Um, we're, we're sort of, um, the Fed is on hold, and I, um, I, I mean, uh, I, I don't think this is at all because anybody's trying to pressuring them. I think it's because they're seeing, um, if you look at, uh, at their mandate, um, uh, um, they, despite this uh, interesting experiment of having a big uh, fiscal stimulus at, at the top of the cycle, uh, they, they don't feel uh, the need to increase interest rates. So, uh, while, yes, of course, if int interest rates globally and uh, particularly importantly in the U.S. were to go up um, as a result of, uh, uh, you know, fiscal stimuli and, and, if you will, normalization, what some people a couple of years ago, I think, expected simply uh, interest rates to go back up to where they were um, uh, before the crisis, uh, empirically, that's not really what we're seeing. 
Um, and so, yes, uh, one has to bear the, the risk of rising interest rates in mind, in particular if there's a sort of term mismatch between the length of your project and the length of your borrowing. But right now, it seems um, uh, that even in the US, we, we're, not, uh, uh, we're, we're not all bracing for, for much higher interest rates. So, so in a sense, it's, it's something to worry about, but apparently uh, uh, not just yet. Shall we take one from that side? Um, the microphone is actually just there, so you can just walk up to it and give us your name and go ahead with your question or comment. Uh, good morning. Um, this is a question for um, the minister from Zambia, uh, Mrs. Mwanakatwe. It, uh, it was very encouraging to hear your breakdown of the otherwise amorphous concept of good debts uh, as being primarily infrastructure financing, or transport, power, were, were two of the sectors you focused on. I wonder if you could share with us, admittedly at a, at a, at a high level, just some of, um, some of the thinking uh, in your government as it approaches projects such as the Lusaka Ndola Highway. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of two numbers in this regard. This is a 315 kilometer stretch and the price tag is 1.2 billion. So this works out at approximately 3.8 million per kilometer. Um, again, high level, what, what sort of discussions, deliberations are policymakers undertaking to arrive at a positive NPV for projects such as this? Okay. And if you, if you could just sort of flow from that into energy, the current discussions to embark on nuclear power, and aviation, the current initiative to revive Zambia Airways after three, two <coughs> prior attempts. All right, that Thank might you. just take the rest of the session, but um, <laughs> don't, don't we'll, we'll, try, and, we'll try and get you to um, answer that as, as quickly as you can, because there's a lot of good questions and points in there. Yes. Now, that, that is a good question. And that is the innuendo that I talk about that goes out there. And if we're not sharing information, then uh, that begins to spiral. Lusaka and Dola is, is a very, very economic road. And our discussions around the cabinet are looking at concessional, are looking at PPP. It's very PPPable. So we're looking at that. Okay. <laughs> And also with that 1.2 billion, it's not all road. It is bypasses, it is filling stations, it is hotels, it is housing. We're trying to make that an economic zone from Lusaka right up to Ndola. So when you see that 1.2 billion, you need to break it down to that. But it's a road that I don't have sleepless nights over because I've had so many offers, I think at least three on uh, contractors coming forward and saying, we want to do that on a PPP. Let me take you to power. After the power deficit that happened uh, a couple of years ago, we, we decided we're going to make this a major sector, especially for export. We were hydro in the main, about 98%. Uh, today, we've got solar, we've got thermal, and going into the future, 2020, 750 megawatts is coming on board on Kafir Gorge Lower. And going into 2025, we've got 2,400 megawatts of power coming on board. Power for us is absolutely critical because we are sitting um, right in the middle of eight countries and we're putting transmission lines with the help of the World Bank funding. And we want to connect into um, East Africa. We've got DRC that is needing power. We've got Malawi that's needing power. We believe that for us, this is a sector where we will um, welcome private sector investment to be able to, to, to sit uh, pretty and be able to be a net exporter of this non-traditional export. So um, I believe that's, uh, that I've answered both your questions. Was there anything else that I missed from there? I think that just about covers it. And thank you for that new word, PPPable. Um, <laughs> let's, let's take one at the front here and then we'll come, we'll come to this side. I'm, I'm afraid you'll have to go to the microphone. Do, we don't have any roving microphones. Um, so just go ahead, um, your name and a quick question or comment. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mike Obadan. I'm from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Um, 
the issue of uh, debt accumulation, debt vulnerabilities. I think in one of the sessions yesterday, the point was stressed that one of the new challenges facing the global economy is the rapid buildup of debt by a number of countries. Um, I'm wondering, uh, because I haven't seen answers to the question I'm going to ask, say what exactly is responsible for the new debt accumulation that could possibly lead to crisis? Uh, is it a result of macroeconomic shocks or poor economic governance you know, leading to debt accumulation and inability to pay. And I'm wondering whether the IMF has, you know, done studies in that regard, because if we are to prevent uh, a, further, a debt crisis, then the causal factors must be found, and then reforms, you know, put in place accordingly. And then the countries would have the, would need the discipline to implement reforms that will prevent debt accumulation. Now, second question directly to the minister. A very Zambia. brief one. Uh, yes. Uh, the issue, you know, she has mentioned that uh, the borrowings from, from Zambia constitute good debt uh, because you're investing in infrastructure, maybe social sector and all that. But at the same time, if I heard you correctly, you mentioned that Zambia is one of the vulnerable countries. And if that is the case, uh, what strategies have you put in place to minimize vulnerabilities and you know, prevent falling into a debt crisis? All uh, right. Thank you, Mike. Thank uh, you. Let's take a second one from here, and then we'll come back and, and, and answer those two. Just, yes, just go ahead and step up to the microphone. My name is Perks Ligoya. I'm from Malawi. I am at the UN in New York, and I'm chairing the LDC group. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Standard Chartered talked about blended finance. This has been introduced to us, and uh, we would like to understand it more. For blended finance to work, uh, you need to combine it with uh, public funds or concessional funds. I wonder whether this dialogue has already started between the, the banks, the private sector, and the ODA funders, and what are the modalities? Because in the past, we, we've talked about uh, privatization, for example, it, it was good at times, but not always, what does blended finance bring? What, what new thing does it bring that you believe can work better? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, um, let's answer those two. Uh, would anyone like to take Mike's question about, uh, this was touched on a little in MD Furusawa's address, but uh, the drivers uh, of debt in the current moment. Any, anyone would like to, no takers? <laughs> Shall I pick on someone? <laughs> okay, um, Madam Minister, why don't you go ahead and answer the second question while I, while I pick a victim for the first one. Right. Uh, what are we doing about the vulnerability? We're doing several things. One, it is ensuring that we broaden our tax base. And uh, uh, straight away from the 2019 budget, we've seen uh, a ramping up of, um, of um, resources. We need to broaden. We are, in a way, a bit like Chad, where we have a huge informal sector. How do we bring that into the formal sector? How do we make sure that they pay their taxes? We've decided to go E in the main um, and try and remove the human intervention into the, uh, the, the, the tax um, uh, process so that we can get more people paying taxes. The, the other thing we're doing in the mineral, in the mining sector, we have uh, changed our tax regime, again, to ensure that that huge sector that is giving the country at least 70% of its foreign exchange, that sector is contributing positively to GDP growth 
and to uh, resource mobilization. So our mineral royalty tax regime has changed and also the way that it is tiered um, has changed. We are moving from VAT, value added tax, to sales tax because we found ourselves in a constant refund position. And from July the 1st, we are looking at a sales tax regime that is a hybrid between VAT and sales tax to ensure that we can safeguard that value addition that has happened hitherto and that we want to see um, uh, going forward that it is um, continuing. With that, we've seen the numbers that are going to be an uplift on the current um, uh, revenue base uh, from value added tax. Yes, we are going very much to PPP and we have strengthened our act to ensure that we are more robust and we um, attract the private sector in the, in the area of PPP. And that's proving uh, quite beneficial to us. Mm. So for us, fiscal consolidation is happening and ensuring that expenditure is going to the right places and also maintaining fiscal discipline, absolutely critical, so that public resources can be uh, gainfully employed. Thank you. If I may pick on you, Honourable Minister from Chad, to touch on that question about uh, the debt drivers, because uh, we've, we've talked, of course, about the low interest rates and high commodity prices that may have pushed many uh, low, lower income countries into uh, the debt situation that we see now. But you talked about oil revenue and that being a, a big factor for the state in which you, your economy is in and what you're trying to do about that. So perhaps you could just quickly address that question of what is driving the sort of debt that we're seeing across countries now? Uh, I admit that uh, 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 the errors are not been committed in the utilization of the debt. Mais euh, toute dette mal utilisée constitue en, en lui-même une, une, une faiblesse, constitue en elle-même une faiblesse. Mais euh, il est vrai aussi que pendant les périodes de surchauffe, comme nous on a eu à, à connaître, avec le boom de produits pétroliers, euh, il y a eu un endettement, un endettement relativement important. Et nous n'avons pas su nous euh, prémunir, prévenir le choc du retournement des cours du pétrole. Et ça, euh, ça nous a mis devant un, un, une situation qui a, euh, qui a été brutale pour nous. Mais euh, euh, dans le cas spécifique du Tchad, je voudrais aussi insister sur un aspect euh, euh, particulier qui, quelque part, est venu casser un peu la trajectoire que nous avons dessinée pour notre pays, à savoir la question de la sécurité. Cette question de la sécurité nous a totalement... Euh, des accès, déstabiliser. Parce que les ressources euh, suscitées, sollicitées par euh, euh, la sécurité pour lutter contre l'insécurité constituent pour nous une source réelle, de, un handicap réel pour euh, euh, le décollage, euh, l'évolution de notre économie. Et ça, ça a permis également quelque part de nourrir un peu le stock d'endettement que nous avons. En nous, en nous privant de ressources euh, 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 nécessaires à faire face à l'endettement, mais aussi en cassant un peu la trajectoire de notre économie qui devait euh, être euh, montante. Donc voilà un peu à notre niveau ce que nous euh, pouvons dire dans le cas du Tchad, euh, qu'est-ce qui a pu nourrir bon. Il est vrai euh, que de ce côté-là, on a tendance à vouloir partager peut-être les responsabilités pour dire qu'il euh, y a forcément une responsabilité aussi du prêteur. Euh, mais euh, il me semble que notre responsabilité est certainement la plus grande. In what way are the lenders responsible? In, in what way are the lenders responsible? You said in, in some ways lenders are responsible. Could you expound on that? Oui, mais les prêteurs sont responsables. Moi, j'ai été dans une vie antérieure banquier. Euh, je, quand je prête de l'argent, je veille à ce que euh, l'objet du, du crédit soit euh, observé et respecté. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas une certaine, euh, je veux dire, euh, complaisance Okay. 
All right. I, th I think you're rounding out uh, Mr. Weisacker's point very diplomatically um, uh, that he made earlier. Uh, I, I appreciate that there's lots of questions, but we've only got five minutes on the clock, and uh, I'm afraid we, we do need to... Yes? Yes, I, I, I just like briefly, I mean, there was yes. a gentleman asking about blended finance. Yes, yes. Uh, and there's a very quick way to answer that. There's an excellent OECD report that was published in October last year giving an overview of br roughly 750 different instruments in the space of blended finance. <laughs> and now, um, in the interest of time, I, I don't think I'll explain <laughs> You'll give that. us 200 but I, I would like to point you to it. And perhaps I would also like to mention, since, since we're launching this um, in Germany, uh, which is also a form of blended finance, we, we're, we're putting up two funds within the context of Compact with Africa, one called Africa Grow, one called Africa Connect, investing alongside private investors in SMEs and also German companies are wanting to set up um, a shop in, in, in compact with Africa countries. So, so there, there, there are lots of, uh, a lot of creativity can go into what, what we mean by blended finance. It's, it's, I mean, not all of it is good, but by and large, I think it's a huge, interesting ecosystem that needs to be explored and developed further. And I just want to give you a pointer since you asked that question. <coughs> Thank you for answering that. Now, as, as, as we sort of wrap up this discussion, uh, we started off with talking about where we are. It's a delicate moment, but I want to just get us end with a sense from all of you here about what, what we might see in the next 10, maybe that's too far, five, 10 years, and what, what you fear might happen if the right steps aren't taken, and, and what is the promise? What, what, what are the bright spots? What, uh, what is the optimism? Um, that you have. I'll start with you, Honourable Minister. Oui, merci beaucoup, Madame, de commencer euh, par moi. Mais on ne peut qu'être optimiste. On ne peut qu'être optimiste pour l'Afrique. L'Afrique euh, regorge beaucoup de potentialité, potentialité humaine, parce que euh, on a une ressource humaine jeune qui ne demande qu'à travailler, qui ne demande qu'à s'exprimer. Nous avons euh, des ressources euh, euh, incommensurables. Donc, il va falloir euh, forcément réviser la façon d'accompagner l'Afrique dans son développement. C'est à cela qu'il faudra euh, penser. Euh, il est euh, dans le contexte où on, on est. Il est souvent aisé de dire, bon, euh, on a des programmes d'ajustement. Je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, on ajuste, c'est vrai. L'ajustement, il faut l'admettre, est quelque part récessif. Mais il faudra penser à mettre en place tout un programme de développement. Un programme de développement, il y a eu pour l'Europe le plan Marshall et d'autres plans ont été prévus pour certaines régions. Pourquoi il ne serait pas, il serait impossible de concevoir un tel dispositif pour l'Afrique Surtout pour l'accompagner et en, en tenant compte des spécificités des uns et des autres. Si on arrive à s'entendre, à réviser, à repenser un peu notre manière de concevoir les choses, d'accompagner l'Afrique, en ce moment, je vous assure que l'Afrique surprendra tout le monde. Thank you, Honorable Minister. No. Mr. Salakde, what, what about your predictions and how are you going to keep Bangladesh on this trajectory? Well, um, our future is good, but we have to be very, we have to be very careful. You see... Um, for attaining the SDG goals, we need to invest additional 15% of GDP every year. So that's the challenge. Uh, 2.5 million children every year come into school. So we have to build the excess capacity, you know, for the education and of, and of course, quality education. Uh, we need to reduce the poverty and also to address the income inequality. And, you know, uh, if government invest, that actually does not create job. So we, we need to invest the private sector that creates job. So job creation also is very important. So, well, uh, for addressing all these things, we need additional resources to invest. And uh, when we proudly say that we are graduating from low-income to high-income countries, then constitutional loans is dried out. So we have to borrow from the market-based uh, uh, borrowings, and that actually creates risks and vulnerability in future, so if you're not uh, very careful. So we, we need to address all these things. At the same time, we, we have to you know, keep uh, growing and, and, and achieve the uh, development goals, of course. Thank you. Honorable Minister. 
thank you. For, for me, I ask myself two questions constantly. Are we going back to the old debt, meaning the hippie debt? I think the answer is no. Are we accumulating debt blindly? The answer is no. As long as we're investing now for tomorrow, we're borrowing for investment and not consumption, we should be able to continue. Under fiscal consolidation, which is very much driven uh, to private sector development and participation, and fiscal discipline is a must. Thank you. Mr. Hanna. Um, thank you. I think maybe just to pick up on the question about interest rates, I, I think it is, we, we are, we have had for the last 10 years an incredibly conducive period for sovereigns uh, and emerging markets to borrow. Uh, and I think we shouldn't be complacent that that may continue. Uh, and I think that requires lenders and investors being very responsible in how they think about that. And it also requires borrowers being very prudent and building resilience and risk management uh, frameworks to ensure that they can cope with shocks that come into it. I think particularly we've all talked about the challenge for the SDGs and the increased financing that's required um, and the fact that the official aid also is not particularly growing. So what that means is that we've got to think more creatively about using what we've got. And I think the encouraging thing is there is a lot of innovation around things like blended finance. Um, and I think there's a lot of thoughtfulness about how we can unlock capital um, away just from the Ministry of Finance and into sort of sub-sovereign areas and countries. Um, and I think with the increased focus and, and thoughtfulness, I'm sure we'll find a way forward. Thank you very much. Mr. Weizsäcker. I'm, um, I, I'm optimistic and I'm more optimistic uh, um, after li listening to, 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 to the colleagues on the panel. Um, I think much of what um, um, make up our debt vulnerabilities can actually be prevented by learning the lessons from the past. And I think if we're serious about doing that, we can be optimistic about the future. Well, that's wonderful. This could have been a very gloomy conversation, considering uh, it's about debt, but it has not turned out that way at all. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists, um, reminding us that debt can be good if it's well managed. And uh, my grandmother has a proverb for everything. Um, for the second point, she probably would have given you this one. Don't make a goat to your friend if your skirt is made of leaves. <laughs> if you don't understand that one, you can see me later. But basically, uh, it's, it's, it's always important for countries to borrow wisely, as you said, Madam Minister, to think about why they're borrowing and absolutely debt can be good. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and your attention and have a wonderful day.